you. Thanks for having me here. So I am going to tell you and reflect upon some of the things you've heard already today, give you my perspective. Also tell you a lot about my own personal experience in this area and give you some sense of where I think the field is going. So again, I think you've heard about this already. This is an area of just huge interest. Uh, um, the idea about you know, tailoring medicine to a person. Again, I think Gary said it's been around a long, long time, but I think we really are in an era unlike any other where the information you can garner about people and give people is just way beyond what anyone has ever done before. And I think genome sequencing, quite frankly, is just the tip of the iceberg. It's a very, very small part of what's about to come. This actually frames a lot of our thinking in this area, that is your health, and I like to refer to it as a health safe because you toggle between healthy periods and disease periods. And it's a combination of your DNA up there in the upper left, your genome, but it's also many other inputs as well, the food you eat, the pathogens you may be exposed to, various life stresses, exercise, all of these in some fashion contribute to your health state. And I would argue the goal of us is to try and understand, us meaning I'm a scientist, uh, is to try and understand this in probabilistic terms. That is to say, you're born with a certain genome, and I'm a believer in the future, we will get our genome sequence before birth. Uh, you, with a certain genome, you'll be able to predict with certain exposures what possible health outcomes you might have in probabilistic terms, not in purely definitive terms, but I do think in probabilistic terms. And th that's not a new concept, it's been around a long time. And I don't know if you've seen that movie Gattaca, but uh, uh, how many of you have seen the movie Gattaca? Everybody in this crowd. How many haven't seen the movie? A few. So you can buy it for $5 at Walmart. I'm not kidding. You. It's a, and, uh, you know, it's a 19, something like 92 movie. Uh, maybe it's 93, something like that. But actually, a lot of the issues in there are incredibly relevant even for today. It talks about insurance and the whole thing, if you um, want to check it out. Anyway, you've probably seen this already. The cost of genome sequencing is plummeting. It's at the point where we now pay $1,400 for a human genome sequence. We buy them in batches. That's a research genome. A clinical genome, it depends exactly what you order, and they're done in more special labs called CLIA labs. Uh, they can run around 2,500, uh, possibly up to 5,000, depending exactly what you're getting. Uh, but mind you, um, that's just the sequencing cost. The actual interpretation at least the way we do it for a healthy person, it's about $15,000. It's quite expensive because there's a lot of manual curation involved, and I'll explain that later. Uh, for a cancer genome, believe it or not, it's a lot less for the interpretation because you're zooming in for very certain changes and trying to find, figure out drugs, and there, there it's a lot more targeted in what you're looking for. Anyway, this is to give you a sense of what um, these costs are. But by the way, that, what that means is because it's becoming cheaper, and it, quite frankly, it will obviously go under $1,000. In fact, it may become a few hundred dollars in the not so far future. Uh, it means everyone will be capable of getting their genome sequence. So it's not, you know, can I get my genome sequence? It's whether you want to get your genome sequence and what you might learn from it, and how will you incorporate that information into your healthcare. At least that's how I see this area going. So you've heard about some of this already because genomics is becoming inexpensive. It's being used directly now in medicine. So you've heard about cancer, and I'll flip through a few of our personal experience here, mystery diseases. One area I wasn't going to talk about, and I'm not sure if it's on your program, but uh, these days you probably know you can actually sequence DNA from a fetus by sequencing the blood of a mother. And th there's an FDA-approved test for a trisomy of chromosome 21, 18, and 13, so three different um, trisomies you can detect. And just last year alone, there were a million of those tests run. And this test didn't exist a few years ago. So this is how quickly that's going to take over the field. Amniocentesis, it's on its way out. And quite frankly, you could actually sequence in principle, and it's been done, sequence the entire DNA. It's tricky, but you can do it. We don't yet know the accuracy, but you can sequence the entire DNA of a fetus by sequencing the blood of a mom. That technology does exist. It's all research for the moment. But you can think about where that will take the field forward in the future. Uh, again, it's because there's a few percent, starting about week five, it's something like 4% uh, of the DNA in a mother is from the fetus, and by late stage, it's something like 13%. It's a fair amount of DNA that's floating around the blood belongs to the fetus. So the other area where we'll see big impact, you've heard about this, so I won't spend much time on this, although I guarantee if you get your genome, one thing you will always see is something useful about your potential 
drug sensitivities or uh, side effects uh, uh, from your genome sequence. So if you don't learn anything else, you'll always learn something about that. And the area that's kind of controversial, you've heard about this from Dr. Parker this morning, but um, you know, how useful is genome sequencing for managing healthcare in healthy people? And, that, and that's the outstanding question. I think people are now warming up to the idea, but I guarantee a few years ago, everybody in the medical profession was pretty opposed to this for the most part. All right, so just to flip through a few of our examples, again, this will touch and just put this in perspective, but we do, as do other groups, pretty much a lot of the top places are all doing cancer genome sequencing. It is a genetic disease, both in terms of predisposition, meaning germline mutations you can inherit, but also mutations that acquire as someone grows, you know, goes through life and grows. And so you get genetic changes that occur as cancer forms. And it depends on the cancer, but there can be as many as 10 to 20 so-called driver mutations responsible for causing these cells to grow out of control. And the one thing that's been learned by sequencing now thousands of cancers is that if you've sequenced one cancer, you've sequenced one cancer. They're all different, okay? And that's why this is so powerful, and that's why individualized medicine, precision medicine, whatever you want to call it, is so important. Because the name of the game then is to sequence a person's cancer. Typically, the way we do it, we'll sequence their cancer material and their normal material so we can see the changes that have occurred. And then from that, try and find, you won't necessarily find all the driver mutations, and all the driver mutations may not be actionable. I mean, there may not be drugs that deal with that, but you're trying to find at least one, and going forward, it'll be more than one, but certainly trying to find at least one that's targetable. And this is mostly done, as, a, as you heard about, for late stage patients partly because it's a new field, partly because uh, a lot of these drugs are nasty, actually, so um, they have serious side effects. This is actually the very first patient we se sequenced. It's a metastatic colon cancer. Um, it was known that about 2% of patients had changes in uh, a, a gene called EGFR, and this particular individual was amplified in this region. This stands for epidermal growth factor receptor. The name isn't so critical, but it's almost certainly a driver mutation that causes these cells to grow out of control. And again, it was rarely known to be involved in colon cancer, but by sequencing this individual, we saw that they were amplified in this gene, and it suggested this patient, now mind you, they had their colon re you know, removed, their cancerous part, but they went on uh, one of two, they went on one of the two approved drugs. Now, it had been approved, as you heard from Dr. Parker, in this case, the, the drug had been approved for non-small cell, non cell lung carcinoma, not for colon cancer. But because we saw this, doctors have the freedom to operate off-label. They prescribed one of those two drugs, and uh, the, as far as I know, the patient's been cancer-free ever since their surgery, and they've been on this drug. Now, can't prove anything out of that because the cancer was there, but nonetheless, that option would not have existed had we not sequenced their DNA. We would not have known to use EGF receptor, which in this case was uh, the target for that. Uh, we'd not, we would not have known to use the drug that targets EGF receptor had we not sequenced their DNA. Does that make sense? Can you Everyone? just clarify, did you say it was used for lung cancer? Yeah, it had been known to, yeah, had been known because those mutations, EGFR, were known to be rampant in lung cancer patients. And so people would just come up with drugs for that, Could for I ask lung you a quick, cancer. Quick yep. question, clarification. You said there are 10 to 20 driver mutations in all cancers, you mean, or in any given cancer? It, in any given, it varies with some, some of the cancers that may be fewer driver mutations, and in others it's probably more. But if it, in any uh, it particular can, person, it, in any particular person, it's generally thought to be more than one mutations okay. causing the the cancer. So it's not, and it's a not typical any. number of people throw out is five driver mutations. Now, mind you, when you sequence a cancer genome, it depends on the type of cancer. Some of them have few. They might have, like, when you sequence their 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 cancer DNA versus their normal, you might see 20 for the cancers that don't have very many changes. There's a few cancers, and then there's others where there'll be a hundred thousand changes most of which aren't drivers, they're probably passengers that are coming along. And that's where it gets very tricky to figure out what's a driver and what's a passenger. Do you need a certain number of drivers to create the cancer? Or, or probably, because there's multiple yeah. uh, checks and controls on cells so, so, so that you don't... So it's just one or two? It's, yeah, it's rarely one or two. And some of the germline cancers, for example, what, the reason they wind up leading to cancer is that they have defects in repair machinery. 
So what happens is that they start accumulating, they usually have one copy of their repair machinery defective, they acquire a second mutation somewhere along the way, and then suddenly lots of mutations pop up and that really leads cells growing out of control. Does that make sense? So if you're defective in fixing your DNA, you lose your, you cause all kinds of changes and that's what leads to it. In fact, BRCA, you've heard of the BRCA one mutation, that's actually your repair gene. Okay, and that leads to changes in DNA. Oh, sorry, you yeah. That under certain circumstances, doctors can use drug off labels. That's correct. They can do what they think is best for their patient. They can always. They can use drugs off label, and this happens quite a bit. Right, but, but because of the, they knew which gene to target, then they. Yeah, use because in this drugs case. That's right, because in this case, the way the study had been rolled out, it had been rolled out on lung cancer. This is the early days. Now I think this is, people are becoming, com it's becoming commonplace to sequence the cancer. You're really going to reclassify cancer, by the way, based on gene mutations in the future as much as you will from the site of origin. So it's not going to be a matter like this won't be colon cancer of the future. This will be colon cancer with an EGF receptor amplification because that latter information is probably more important than the fact that it's a colon cancer. Does that make sense? So I think we're going to reclassify the way we use our terminology here. The approved drug on the mar that's on the market for lung cancer, is there an investig is, is there another study for the indication now of colon cancer? Now there is, yeah. Because of this, it may already uh, even be, may be approved, yeah. I'm not quite sure. That We did this in about 2010. So I mean, right now the FDA requires a whole new study for each indication. They do. Right? Well, in the future, it'll just, have, it'll just be a study approved for this type of genetic mutation. Well, I think in the future it'll be, we'll classify people based on these genetic, what we think of the driver mutations, or at least describing mutations we see. And then the FDA will still want to see efficacy because one thing about cancer is that it, the drugs don't always work. <laughs> Even though, you know, sometimes you'll see a change and it's like, that drug should really kill that cancer, and it doesn't because probably some bypass pathways activated. So just because we see that change doesn't guarantee that drug will, will kill that cancer. Uh, but it does work a lot, and I guarantee in every case it's never a cure. Well, in nearly every case, I should say. That is, in virtually all cases, um, patients go into remission if it's a good case, but then it always comes back. There's always recurrence. Sometimes that's five years later, in the case of some cancers and some drugs, so you may have heard of CML, you can treat that with a drug called Gleevec, and they go into remission typically for a pretty long time, but it nearly always comes back. And the reason it comes back is because there's just so many cancer cells loaded in, and that you can't possibly kill them all with one drug. There'll be some resistant changes in their DNA that they can get around. So I think cancer will go the field of like AIDS where you'll use combination therapies and the timing will be important and things like that. But I think that's the way it's going to roll out. Turn it in into a future. chronic condition. Into, well, that may be as well, but even to get it down in the first place, I think to have two drugs is better, gonna be better than one in the future. To use <laughs> combination therapy. Uh, pers the first personalized medicine? Uh, that's one, yeah, it, in many respects, that's, it certainly added a big oomph to the field, um, that is to say, because that's, that was targeting a very specific change, genetic change. It, it, it affects a gene called ABLE, it's a kinase, it uh, just gets for the aficionados here, but it's a particular um, class of, uh, it's a particular enzyme, and that drug hits that. It turns out it hits a few other kinases, very related things, and they actually pop up in other cancers, including one pops up in colon cancer, actually. It's called and it is a tumor, it is a tumor uh, genetic variation. Not yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the driver mutations that's caused, it's responsible. There's, again, there's many different driver mutations out there, and some of them are targetable and some of them aren't. And as you heard about this morning, some of them, you may not be able to directly target that mutation, but you can target something downstream. Mm -hmm. And so even if you can't block the, the disease-causing mutation, you might be able it activates a pathway that turns on something downstream, and you can try and target that. And I can tell you a personal experience. My uh, mother-in-law had ovarian cancer a long, long time ago, and then it came back a few years ago, first slowly and then incredibly aggressively. Her health was just declining very rapidly. She was being treated at Sloan. 
and it's the only time in my life I pulled out, this is Mike Snyder, I know you're doing everything you can, but uh, if I could, you know, maybe I could help with the genetics and sequence her DNA, uh, and uh, you know, if there's some way I could help out, I'd be happy to. Now we had some logistical issues. It seemed pretty clear to me they weren't gonna do anything, you know, her health was declining very rapidly, uh, but um, because of that, they, there were issues about transferring material, these barriers you sometimes get you very frustrated they think we had trouble getting them over the Palo Alto. Nonetheless, they did do a bunch of tasks and they found something uh, in, in that in a, in a particular pathway and she became eligible for a drug in a phase three trial. And she actually responded well to that. So she lived probably nine months longer than she would have. Now she did ultimately die, so it did come back. But for her, that was a very important nine months because uh, you know, she has two daughters and she got to sort of work things through with them and you know, all the things that you want to have time to do. I think it was an incredibly valuable nine months, probably very expensive nine months, I imagine, too. So, um, and I can't imagine a future where, like if, and I won't reveal too much, but um, I can't imagine having a family member and not getting their genome sequence mm -hmm. if they had cancer. So I think there's gonna be some standard of care, either whole genome, exome, or targeted versions thereof, I think will all become very important. And as I say, I, and it's come up a lot in our department, and I always volunteer, we'll go in and sequence their DNA. The worst case you learn is that they're on the right drug already. We sequence someone who had breast cancer. You, some of you may have seen the HER2 positive stains today. Uh, well, the one individual um, uh, related to somebody in our department, they were known to be HER2 positive. We sequenced them. They were amplified just like that for HER2. And so the reaction was, all right, they're on the right drug. And people felt good about that because those tests have a certain false positive rate. And so it's nice to say, well, that was the best drug she should be on and she is on. So that's good. So the worst case is you're on the right track. <laughs> but, but the best still. case is you'll learn something new like this that you would not have known before. Sorry, cut you off. No, no. All right. We should probably move to a few other stories here. So. This one, here's a few numbers for you. Undiagnosed diseases or undiagnosed odysseys. You heard about that this morning. These are some numbers and they're roughly right. 0.4% uh, of live births uh, are born with some sort of serious health defect that they can't figure out. And some people have estimated as many as 8% of adults have some sort of genetic disorder that comes up later in life. Things like hypercardiomyopathy, you often don't see when they're kids, you see them later in life that's more common than you think. Um, so these are some numbers, and if you just work out those numbers, that's 25 million U.S. citizens, and it's estimated to be, from an economic standpoint, $5 million per individual per lifetime. So what's happening now is people are turning to genome sequencing in these cases. Uh, I think I'll skip this first one. This is a very famous case. Uh, actually, uh, I think Gary showed a picture of, well, maybe I'll review it briefly, where there is this, um, case where two twins were born. You may have heard this. This is the Berry twins. They were born and they had, uh, they were called floppy babies. And the mother actually figured it out that they had some sort of dystonia. And it was known that for at least some cases of dystonia, you could give them L-dopamine. And that showed a big improvement when they give it to the kids. But they weren't fully cured. And in fact, their symptoms continued and got worse to the point they were teenagers. Now. Their father was involved was one of the involved in one of the sequencing companies. So they sequenced the genomes of the kids and the parents. And in the end, let's see if I oh yeah, this works. Nope, doesn't work. See that SPR gene with the red X? They discovered that was inactivated. And the reason they figured that was a causative gene, so it was inactivated in both kids, that pathway makes dopamine. See that's a pathway. Everything up there forms a pathway. See how it makes dopamine in the bottom left? Sorry, I can't point to it. But it also makes something called serotonin, which is another neural transmitter. And you don't give people serotonin, you give them this um, serotonin precursor. It's right above it, it says five, I think it's HTP. Oh, yeah. If I can, my eyes aren't that great. So uh, they actually gave the kids that one, and now they seem to be symptom free. So by sequencing their genome, they actually, in this case, led to a therapeutic treatment. So like others have said, about 5% of the cases we can so-called solve, or we think we can solve, find causative mutations for these kids that are born. This is a very common case, so this one I'll show you here. This is one of the first ones we took on. This is a case with a child with developmental delay, intellectual disability, um, hearing problems, some liver problems, all kinds of nonspecific 
defects, very hard to figure out what might be wrong with them. So it's very early on, so we sequence the child, we sequence the mother and father. There's only one affected child, so it makes it very challenging. And the complication is those are, see those SNVs, those stand for single changes. <laughs> there are tens of thousands of these. This is what you're wading through. So you wind up wading through those that sit inside the genes, and there can be 10,000 of those. And you're kind of sorting through all these to find what could be the cause of the mutation for this that's, child. That's the manual curation you're talking about. Well, you can do a lot of this automatic. That part is automatic. But at the end, yes, the, the last part, I'll show you the best example, the manual part. <laughs> um, in the end, we zoomed in on seven candidates that are sitting there at the bottom. And we were stuck. That's where we were. Any one of those seven, for all practical purposes, could have been causing that child's problem. It turns out a, a second child was sequenced at Duke, who and the publishers, and somehow they posted their information on a blog, and the match got made between this child, we, were, we had sequenced, and that child. It was clear that they were of similar characteristics, called phenotypes, very similar characteristics. And so they had posted that their child had that N-Gly1. See the bigger, bold one, N-Gly1 there at the bottom? They had had that same, yep, that's it. It's the Wilsey kids, so those are the ones we sequenced. Um, so this is in the press. It got a lot of attention about a year ago. Uh, and the only reason we solved that, I mean, we were waiting through these genes, but it was tough, was because it was a second child. And so the lessons out of this, it's really important to share this information. There are now 26 kids out there. And it's only because this is getting shared people realize this. Otherwise, the, that family, by the way, had been to like 100 hospital visits all around the world. The parents would not give up. In fact, they came this early on to get their genome sequence. They really wanted to go the latest technologies. And they must have spent a fortune just trying to solve their child. And the way it got matched was through a blog. And that's so a crazy a way to do it? this stuff, right? Was there a target for it? A, a no. A so, in fact, drug? that's the other lesson out of all this. In almost all cases for us, we've rarely found anything actionable. In fact, I will say, for us, we've never found anything actionable. But for other groups, you heard about the case this morning with Dustin. They found something. I mentioned the Berry twins. There's a handful of cases where it's led to a therapy. It's not, it's very, that's very rare. But what it, it has importance, I think that's summarized here. So here's just some summary. So the success rate is about 25%. The information's almost never actionable, but at least in some of our families, it's helped them in um, planning their future kids. That is, they're turning to IVF and then selecting in vitro fertilization and selecting embryos and that don't have both these mutations. Uh, and so as much as they love the child they have, they prefer not to have a second child with the same characteristics. So. Um, then other lessons are, this gets technical, but if you have big families with multiple affected kids, you can usually figure it out quickly. And if you, but like the case I mentioned, one child with two parents un, unaffected, it, it's hard to figure it out. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, unless it's a very specific phenotype, you know what to look for. It's hard to figure it out. And then the last point is that we really do need common databases to share. Yep? Just quickly, who, who blocked that information? It was of the first family that had their child sequenced. And even they, I would argue, weren't 100% certain. Yeah, you can fill them in. Even they weren't, you can circulate that. Even they weren't 100% certain they had the right mutation if you actually talked to the know, parents just, of the study. Like, yeah. The their yeah, so the parents, by the way, could care less about privacy. Everyone we've talked to, they just want their kids solved. So this whole privacy thing. A lot of the stuff in my mind is made up <laughs> by people trying to protect, you know, you know researchers put a lot of time and investment and they often don't like to share their information. So this is a whole new era for them that it's better to share your information. I mean, it's how you solve, it's the only way you're going to solve these cases, right? This is 26 kids, right, out of <laughs> how many zillions of Four birth defects? Year. Yeah, well, a huge number, huge number. get over the whole hurdle, too? Of, I mean, the hospitals and they are, but it's in their best share. interest to share. And I think the way this is going to roll out, there are privacy issues. I think this is my next set of <laughs> slides. So there are challenges of sharing data. You do need large numbers to be able to see this sort of thing. It is siloed at the individual, you know, healthcare providers. Uh, and certainly one argument, which is probably valid, is it's from 
their standpoint, they say it's privacy. For, again, from the family standpoint, they could care less. But nonetheless, um, there is a privacy issue. So I think the way this is going to roll out, what people are talking about is this global alliance you may have heard about, whose intent is to imagine you have cases rather than everybody put their data into a common database, you actually do the queries back with the provider. So if you have some big systems like Kaiser or Geisinger or some of these systems, you actually search back within their database. Uh, you bring your query to them rather than bring your data to yourself to be queried. Does that make sense? No. no. Okay. So <laughs> Kaiser has a giant database. Mayo has a giant database or will with all this information. So in the future, imagine I have that child there. I can't grab all Mayo's data and search it. But I can probably, if we have common tool, software tools set up, I could actually run the query at Mayo. I can say, put those seven variants right through the system. Let me link them up with phenotypes of developmental delay and intellectual disability and see what matches might come up. And then I have to run all the control queries too to make sure, like, you know, if the, some of these you know, changes so if they were too common or they're associated in other ways, they're probably not right. So you have to run the right controls, but nonetheless, I guess I'm getting a little too detailed here, but the point out of all this is that you can, yeah, I could take those seven mutations and I could query them all here at Mayo if they have the software tool set up in the database, and then the results relay back to me that said, look, I've got five kids with NGLY1 mutations that all have characteristics like yours, and then you just talk to the doctors and, and, and HIPAA, match it up. And HIPAA won't prevent that. I mean, HIPAA won't be Yeah, because the data has never that. formally been shared. And then, again, most people would be willing to share. Most families yeah. would be happy to share. So if you have a recontact mean. clause in especially, uh, and I think that's going to be very important to have these recontact clauses in mm -hmm. so that people, again, the parents will be more than delighted to do that. So it's a matter of getting your Wait, you're saying recontact clause for that when my when I brought in my child who has this mystery disease, recontact me if you find something in your database. You have permission to contact me for any reason, I, I would say. Right, right. <laughs> so sure. you could get that bracket mutation back. Won't be so useful for you, but it might be for your daughter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think I don't know how the Maya consent form is set up, but it it should be set up that way. It's useful for them to have it set up that way. Most people would want to know that. If people who don't, I mean, some people may feel like I don't ever want people to, like there are plenty of people who have breast cancer running in their family that don't want to know. And that's their prerogative. About 30% of people will, will not get tested for BRCA mutations uh, if they have breast cancer running in their family. But, and that's their prerogative. So there may be some individuals who will donate samples and don't ever want to know. Uh, there typically people come in two types. A lot of people say, uh, just give me the actionable information. Then you have to talk to them about what is actionable because one person's actionable may not be another person's actionable. Um, and the other thing you need to do, the other possibility is they want, want to know everything. Like, I'm in that category. I want to know if I have Huntington's even though I can't do a darn thing about it. And okay. why do you want to know? Because I like, I just believe on the motto, more information is better than less information. It would probably help me in my planning. <laughs> I'd, I'm probably the laziest guy about getting my will in order and all those sorts of things. So I would make sure that, if nothing else, I would make sure that was tidied up. Uh, so the idea of going, like, instead of going to the Mayo database, is that the idea behind Obama's the million person database? Like. W you would go there instead, right? No, like I think there's many questions to be addressed with that million pr person project. But we're wouldn't that on the be bus. one of the potential? Um, it is to build a database of this kind of information, yeah, right. that w where you would link clinical records to um, genome sequences. And say, are there, you know, maybe potentially you could find like 10 of those 26 kids or whatever, right? I mean, yeah, that's correct. You'd be able to search <coughs> in that database. Say, so that, oh, yeah, that, so yeah. that should be in a common form. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah, so that from that side, it would be good. Right. So that you wouldn't have to go to these proprietary or in, like you wouldn't have to go to May, you wouldn't have to go to St. Jude's. Well, the odds are you probably want to go everywhere, but yes. Uh, if we could all set it up in a, again, if the tools are common, it wouldn't be that hard, right. the software tools, because everybody's getting their data organized. It's a bit of a mess now, most places, uh, but everybody <laughs> is trying to get their act together so about getting their data organized. So I think 
least the big providers, if you were able to query theirs, it would be incredibly valuable because quite frankly, right. 500 million is going to be better than a million. Right. And that will happen. You, you've said a couple of times if the software tools are common, where, where is that at? I mean, if, if can, can a Mayo find something in the Jews? Well, I think people are talking about trying to, let's see, it's kind of at point two. There's a group of people getting together to try and figure out how to exactly do what I said. you got to get all the data in a common format. It's not trivial to do this. Um, and it probably gets technical, even more technical than I would understand all the. But you've got to get the data in a common format. You have to have tools that will let you search this in yeah, useful fashions. And so not only for the variant, minimally for the variant. The worst case is if I, give me all those variants. It's kind of like a card game. Give me all those variants and then I'll look up the phenotypes. That would be the minimal system. But a better system, you'd get both the variants and the phenotypes associated with it. And then you'd be able to better guess whether I should pursue this one or not. Again, had we had all seven, imagine that system existed, we would query all those seven all at once across a million people, we wouldn't have had to wait. We waited about uh, 10 months, I think it was, before that second child appeared. We could have known instantly that when we first sequenced their DNA. Mike, you said uh, um, eventually every, every cancer will have will be you know, a genetic screening, and eventually right. every person when they're born would have their their genome sequenced. Um, how how soon? I mean, I know it's, I know it's just a guess, but how soon would those uh, two things happen? Uh, well, would, the first one, the cancer sequencing, <clears throat> I think it's going to happen in a few within a few years, uh, and I don't know that it'll be whole genome because that's expensive. But you could do some targeted sequencing. So there's a company called Foundation Medicine that sequences about 300 genes. Um, and so that's the simplest form of this. Um, I'm not saying it's the cheapest form, but that's the simplest form where they do a very targeted panel. Um, for the healthy person genome, this is, let's save that to the end, but if I forget, bring it up. Because they think um, that's more controversial uh, <laughs> for lots of reasons. For, for completely healthy people. For completely healthy people, okay. getting their genome sequenced before birth, right? How important is the sample that's chosen for the one million in terms of? Well, I think uh, is, is one it's million really. Enough? Sorry. Well, it depends on the question you're asking. I, I think one million is fine just to get started. By the way, there is a million veterans project going on to do just this as part of the VA. Um, so I think it's, I look at it as a way to get started. What, it is very important what you choose. My own view, which may or may not agree with other people, is that it, it should be linked to good um, clinical information so we can yeah. have, because just sequencing a million genomes by itself is pretty limited. So we'd like to have good phenotypes. We'd like to know this person has asthma and that person has, you know, uh, ideally you'd like to have people whose diseases have never been solved. Chronic fatigue syndrome is, you know, these mystery diseases, people really still don't know. There's a lot of them out there. I mean, there's a lot of kids who are born each year who never get solved. So um, I think getting those would be important, but also just a lot of plain healthy people. You'll see more information I think should be added on as you hear my story in a minute. Um, so I actually think we would add a lot more. And another big part for me, which again will be very controversial, I would enroll people who would make their data 100% open. Because data that's completely out in the open community is um, used probably a thousand times or more than data that's put behind a wall, a, a, a privacy wall. That leads to all kinds of issues. Yeah. So I'll be in a minority on that one, and I'll but I'll put. But I still think we could get a million people to do that. But in terms of recruitment, I'm just trying to identify. You have these rare diseases, these right. rare disease types. That, I mean, I heard of one similar to what you're talking about where right. the only other person was in Switzerland or something. Like, okay. so how many millions of people do you have to? Yeah, that's going to depend on the disease, right? Um, you know, in this case, right, we're, we're now up to 26 over a few year period. Um, it's just going to depend. Some of them are really rare and some of them are a lot more common. Uh, we just sequenced uh, an inflammatory bowel disease. This is an adult, actually. And um, there we looked at um, we found this one, my postdoc did this, and really liked this one change, and we went to someone who sequenced 143 other inflammatory bowel disease, and sure enough, there were five other patients in there. It's very clear this one he liked was the right mutation. Mm -hmm. So that, in that case, it didn't take so many. Um, 
So it's going to depend on the disease, I think. And some will be really, really rare, rare, and some will be medium rare. So, <laughs> you, you said, pun intended, I you guess. You said that the, yeah. sequ the sequencing alone won't do it any good unless you have the good phenotypes. But isn't that the idea is that they're going to connect it to EHRs, which leads to my next question. Yeah. The EHR data isn't really good enough to It's to not as good as where we'd like to see. I think the VA keeps really good records. We'll see how they all, all the, again, I think it's under discussion, so we hope we'll do a really good job. Uh, but I think if you can reconsent these folks, that'll also be good, because you always have the option then of getting good phenotype at least later, even mm -hmm. if you don't get it right then. These are all great questions, so. Why don't I keep on going? This is the controversial area, and this is the one I want to bring up because I do think this is the future of our field. So this is the idea if you're a healthy person, can getting your genome sequence be valuable to you? And specifically, can you use your genome sequence to predict your risk for disease, maybe diagnose disease earlier, monitor disease states, and treat disease, say, via pharmacogenomics? And you don't do this in a vacuum. You bring in your family history and whatever medical tests you know, you currently do, like blood pressure, things like this. Um, one thing that always surprised me is that when you go to a doctor, you they measure typically about 15 or 20 things, right, when they draw your blood. And um, my lab is one that studies things by the many thousands. Um, so we're a little unusual this way. So I always thought this was very <coughs> primitive. So we launched a project. Now I'm going to tell you about a, sort of a pet project of ours, but I do think it'll be the future. It also relates to my story, which I think will illustrate a lot of the issues. So we are a believer that you don't just bring in the genome. You could add a lot more information as well, like all, all about your RNA, that's your transcriptome, and so on and so forth. I'll explain this best on this slide. So we do something now, what we call personal omics profiling, where in addition to getting their genome sequence, that's their DNA, their top one, the next one is their epigenome. And, and what we do there is we characterize their, met, it's their, your DNA can get modified. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, and it actually does influence your, <laughs> lots of things. It happens during age and during your, <laughs> depending what you eat and things like this. So your epigenome is a big deal. Um, we also measure all your RNA, that's your transcriptome. We, I should say we do most of this out of blood, some we do out of urine, and some we do out of other areas you'll see in a minute. We study, also study your proteins, that's your <coughs> proteome. This is done out of the plasma, you learned about that I think in the tour, that's the fluid in your blood. Uh, we also do that out of your peripheral, your, your immune cells, or called your peripheral blood monocyte cells. We also specifically target your cytokines, which are very important as <coughs> immune modulators, eh, which really affects your health. They don't get quite covered very well by the way we do the proteome. We've set up new methods for following metabolites. Believe it or not, we don't even know all the metabolites in the human body. Um, there are thousands there that we either make or ingest from our food, but we don't know the final number. So we've set up new ways of profiling them. Uh, we follow about 20,000 peaks, although we don't know what they all are. We do that out of blood and urine. We follow the antibodies we make uh, that can react with us. It's called autoantibodies. So you make antibodies when you fight an infection. And we also follow, I won't talk about this, but we have chips that follow the entire, we can put the whole human, all human proteins down on a slide. We can follow the reactivity. And we can also put down all common human viruses so we can see what you're reacting to virus-wise. Um, with your antibody profile. You may save that for later. And lastly, we do five different microbiomes. So we study gut, urine, nasal, tongue, and skin. I'll come to that a little later. So initially, we didn't have the microbiome or the epigenome, and we were following, and our assays were more primitive, but we were following about 40,000 molecules every time we sampled someone. And now we literally make billions of measurements every time we sample someone. Okay. Yeah. So just for logistics, we actually started this out on me. It's because genome sequencing is very controversial. I moved to Sanford about six years ago. And there was a big rage about people worried about their genome sequence and learning all kinds of evil things. And I didn't want to deal with any of that. So we just sampled me. And it was really just to get the technology up and running uh, because we knew it was not going to be trivial to get this up. And so what you'll notice here is that we've actually been doing this for a little over five years. And it really was meant to be a pilot study. I didn't know it turned out to be interesting. Turns out everybody we study is interesting, um, but um, which comes down to personalized medicine, actually. 
But um, basically, we've been doing this for five years, and you'll notice we I've been through seven viral infections during this time. I don't have the last time part on here, but there's another infection there. And they're all common colds. Uh, I have little kids, you can probably tell. Um, <laughs> so I get sick twice each winter. But what, and what are those? Bars, yeah, bars. that's when I think they're blown up area, so that's a timeline down below. So look at the top left, HRV, that's when the study starts. See that zero? That's day zero, that's the day we started. Four days later, we took a second sample. 21 days later, another sample. So and they found these viral particles in your... No, I, I knew I, I got sick, uh, uh, and uh, I took a nasal swab, and we figured out what virus it was. So this was just classical testing, if you will. Um, and then, so what we do is we sample. What you'll notice is about every two to three months when I'm healthy. And then whenever I get sick, we do very dense profiles. So if you look at RSV, say I took blood 289, then the next day 290, then two days later, then two days, two, three days, four days. Do dense sampling when I'm sick, and every two to three months when I'm healthy. And the idea is to look in incredible detail what goes on when you get sick versus what happens when you're healthy. And as I say, we've been doing this, I've given this over 100 times. I do it at interesting times too, like before and after Australia, things like that. They're kind of fun. You did your whole microbiome as well? Well, that started times? about two and a half years ago. It started after that first <laughs> adenovirus infection. So those are all common colds, again. Uh, although I might point out RSV, it's common in kids, it's not common in adults. When adults get RSV, they get pretty sick, which is true for me, I was out for a few days, okay? So that's my sampling regime. And so just to probably summarize this kind of quickly, we started by sequencing my DNA. I'll probably jump over this. I see it shifts around a little bit anyway. And then what we do is we pour over the genome looking for things that might suggest we're at risk for things. So you, there's really three kinds of things you look for. You look for changes in your DNA that are they're called highly penetrant. They're like BRCA mutations, where if you have one of this and you're a woman, high probability you'll get breast or ovarian cancer. Those are strong genetic changes, strong risk alleles. And then there's complex disease risk as well. And then we do look for drug sensitivity, and then based on everybody's profile, we tend to look for specific disease variants as well, based on their family history. So this is a very typical number. This is my genome done early on. So back then, we I have 51 changes that are not common that are predicted to be killing those genes that um, are in genes associated with human disease. Everybody has this typical number, mine is now about 70. Typical number is about 70. We all have these changes in our DNA that are in disease associated alleles. So conclusion number one is if you're a worrier, you should not get your genome. <laughs> okay. Can so you define missense and nonsense? Uh, uh, well, nonsense means it's a it's a change that really inactivates the gene for sure. Missense sometimes can, sometimes doesn't. It's a substitution. Nonsense means you really put it you put a stop code on it and you truncate the protein, which will kill it. This gets a little detailed. The point is, all these are thought to be damaging by one means or other. I haven't gotten into this, but believe it or not, we all have this. And but most of them are just one copies and activated, right? And we have two copies of all our genes, so. Most of this wouldn't necessarily be a big deal, but what's interesting about this, and this is a very typical scenario, I'll talk about this later, but I have one gene in, see that TERT change, the one that says aplastic anemia? I have the exact same change as people who have aplastic anemia, and if you read the literature, I should have aplastic anemia, which I don't. So this is one of the challenges that's there, which is we think that this change is probably contextual. That is to say, it probably is causing disease in some people, but not others. And this is one of the complications in interpreting genomes and how to deal with this. Now, in this case, though, it leaves an obvious thing. You would just can start doing counts for my blood to see if I'm, you know, more likely to have anemia or not. So it can lead the follow-up tests you can do. And by the way, this enzyme actually adds sequences on the ends of my of your chromosomes. Uh, so we, in fact, did measure, you can do that. You can measure how long the ends of your chromosomes are, which we did on me, and they're a little bit shorter for my age group. You're, you may not know this, but your chromosomes get a little bit shorter as you get older. Uh, and um, it actually turns out we sequenced my mom, too. She has the same mutation. She just turned 86. She doesn't have aplastic anemia. So it's not running in our family. But again, this is the kind of challenge you can have. But this is why, imagine having a million 
people out there with clinical records, we can see how many have aplastic anemia and how, know how much you have to worry about this. Well, and then you could also look to see whether, you know, if it is contextual and you need some other mutation. You got it. That That's the power of, of this kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So this is why these data sets will be very valuable for sorting this out because we do know that for some people it is associated with the disease, but we don't know why it's not. So this would argue I'm one of these resilient people for aplastic anemia with that mutation. Uh, so this is the kind of information that could be useful potentially. So you either have something that's protecting you from it or you're missing something that yeah. might be required. It's also possible, by the way, the original study's wrong. True. And that does happen. And I can tell you in some cases that's very clear. I'm not so sure that's true here, though. But I know in other studies it's very clear the information that's in the database is wrong. And that's why it's $15,000. We look up those studies. Before we tell somebody you're at risk for aplastic anemia, <laughs> we go back and look at that paper to make sure, because you don't want to tell somebody, look, you know, you've got this severe disease and, you know, you didn't, nobody looked it up and suddenly, well, that was, had you read the paper, Oops. you realized it was never right. But imagine you're doing this for 70 mutations, right? It's a lot of work. And that's why it's $15,000. So my genome also tells me um, that, uh, which I knew already, uh, I didn't know it was high cholesterol. I'm a great responder to statins. My genome tells me it's statins, so avoid, by the way. Um, and I have two mutations in that gene, GCKR, two different mutations, each an activating gene, one of my father's copy and one of my mother's. And so that's probably why I have high cholesterol. Not that that matters, but it does get, again, my genome told me which statins I should not use. So that's kind of nice to know. I wasn't using them anyway, but. Um, now I know not to. Uh, and then I had some hints about diabetes, which we'll get to in a minute. This is another thing that popped up, which is that, uh, so those are the highly penetrant mutations, as they're called, mutations that with high probability, they're going to cause disease, hemochromatosis, things like this, where if you have it, you know, an activating, those are the really, if you will, nasty mutations that when you knock them out, they cause problems. The other kinds, most common diseases, are thought to be complex disease. So I'm going to try and bring you up to speed a little bit here. They're thought to be generally, in general, <laughs> due to changes of low effect. It needs multiple changes to actually get that effect. Okay, so what people do is they sum up over these multiple changes to see if you're at higher risk or lower risk. This is what 23andMe does. Have any of you had 23andMe done? Mm -hmm. no, only one, yeah. So if you lived in Palo Alto, you'd probably be, half of you would be raising your hands here. <laughs> but anyway, it's, um, so this is what they do, that you, you can sum over these, and it's, it may not be super accurate, but it gives you a sense. It's kind of like your family history in many ways, except it's a genetic version of this. Um, and mine match up really well. You can do this for hundreds of diseases, so no one change. So for example, like um, high cholesterol, there must be 20 different genes that all contribute to this. Again, at each of low effect. And so you add them all up, and if you've got lots of the bad ones, well, you're going to be at higher risk. And if you've got lots of the good ones, you can be at lower risk. And that's how it's done. And, uh, and, and it's crude, but it does mind match up really well with what I knew. You can do this for hundreds of diseases. That's only the top of what's called my risk at RAM. So as a European male, so I'm of European descent, I have a 100% chance of getting one of those diseases at that line on the right. And on the left, I have a 0% chance. That triangle is my starting point. And from my genome sequence, I either have an increased risk in orange, if you can see that orange bar going to the right, or a decreased risk with that blue bar going to the left. See that? Mm -hmm. So for example, obesity, lower risk for that. And that makes sense. Nobody in my family, either side, going back to my great-grandparents, has ever been overweight. I have high cholesterol, I told you that already, that's that hypertriglyceridemia, that's high triglycerides, that's high cholesterol, you can see I go to the right. Uh, same with the lipidemia, that's the same problem. Same, see coronary artery disease, everyone on my father's side has died of some sort of heart problem, that made sense too. There were two surprises on that list, one is basal cell carcinoma. See that big bar to the right, not so good. So I have that, and I just happened to, uh, my brothers and sisters were visiting. I have two, two brothers, three sisters, one sister didn't come. We took blood from them all so we could profile them like me. And we also, I just asked two brothers and one sister what they knew about this, and it turns out each had lesions and basal cell carcinoma. Oh. So in fact, it was in my family history, I just didn't know it. And the reason is, you don't talk about basal cell carcinomas around the dinner table, right? It's, so I like to say your genome's a better record of your family history than your family is. 
because it's it's there. We just don't always know how to interpret it, but the information is there. Just so I understand that graph, yep. the, the points are um, you're less likely to have those problems if you're to the left, yep. more likely to the right, and that's like an error bar? No, that's not an error bar. That's kind of like the increased risk. So let me do the next one, type 2 <coughs> diabetes. That came out early in the study. See that bar? That starts out at about a 26% chance. It increases to a 47% chance of me getting type 2 diabetes in my lifetime by this algorithm. Does that make sense? So it's the increased risk. So I have a twofold, but that means I'm go from this 26 to 47. Over, over time, basically. Well, not really. It means in, in the course of my lifetime, that's my lifetime risk, if you will. It's one way of presenting the information. It's hard to. Point? What the. Um, it's just a general population risk for this, and then based on these genetic okay. variants is when you add in the increase. And this idea started with the Framingham Heart Study, where you could add in from genetic markers, but they also add in smoking, and you know I can make those lines go further if I smoke and if I <laughs> do lots of not so good things, and I can probably make them get better if we add an exercise and things. But we don't know how to. By the so way, those we don't know how. So those starting points are population based. They're not your. They're population based okay. based on a European male. So we did mm -hmm. we did arrange them for that. And by the way, most studies you heard from Gary, they're all done on Europeans. Uh, not always males. It can be males and females. But that is a bias, unfortunately, in genetics. But I think it's one people are trying to correct. Okay. So better keep moving. So the amazing thing was I was deemed to be at high risk for type 2 diabetes. I didn't know. Very, very big surprise uh, for me at the time. But remember, we're, we're making all these measurements in my blood, right? Mil billions of measurements. So we were following my glucose and everything else, all the same standard medical tests. And amazingly, my glucose had been running along normally. But if you see that first time point where it starts going up, that's when I went to actually get a very fancy glucose metabolism test. Uh, and the woman looks at me and she says, no way you have type 2 diabetes. You don't have family history. You don't look it. And I said, yeah, but I sequenced my genome. This is 2010. Uh, and, you know, there, my genome says there's something funny about my glucose metabolism. Can we take a look? At, even before we started the test, my fasting glucose came out high. It's 127. We were both surprised, so she repeats it, comes out 127. Measured a week later, it's even higher. And there's a better test for steady state glu um, uh, glucose. It's called hemoglobin A1C. You see that red hemoglobin A1C percentage? It's sort of your sugar-coated hemoglobin, if you will. Um, I'm at 6.4, and diabetic is classified as 6.5. I'm right on the edge. So five weeks later, I go to my general practitioner. That's the next red line. And of course, she doesn't. She says, there's no way they got it right. Um, uh, you know, you don't look it. <laughs> That's what they always say. And, but we repeated it. And sure enough, uh, my glucose came at 150, and my hemoglobin A1C is 6.7, classified as diabetic. So I can tell you when that was. That was April 11, 2011, because up until then, I had the world's worst diet. I ate lots of sweets. I would not have passed by those desserts on the <laughs> way in. Uh, and, I, you know, I ate <coughs> lemonade, all that sort of stuff, because I didn't know I had a problem, and I didn't, you know, I wasn't aware of this in my family history. I didn't know anything about type 2 diabetes. <coughs> so I basically went cold turkey. I've cut out all exogenous sugar. I still eat carbohydrates and rolls and things, but I don't eat generally straight up, like I don't eat any of those Cokes or things that some of you are having. And I had been biking, but I doubled my biking and I started running. And it didn't happen right away. It took about six months to bring that back down to baseline. So this made a big splash at the time because it's the first time someone used their genome to predict their risk for a disease and in fact got the disease. So scientifically that was good, personally maybe not so good. Uh, but on the other hand, I did catch it early and was able to manage it in that case just by changing my lifestyle. Yeah, great question. So it turns out uh, we went back to my brother and sister. We're all high hemoglobin A1C. Two are exactly the same build as me, and two have builds that are thinner. So we have a metabolic disorder running in my family that we never would have known had we not sequenced my DNA. And one of my sisters started running and, in fact, brought hers down, her hemoglobin A1C down, in just six weeks. So I think it's been valuable to all of us to actually have this information, and I would argue it's incredibly valuable. So some skeptics look, oh, uh, no, but I probably could have figured it out because I was, I should have figured it out is why I say it. Well, let me, hold that thought. One more second. Let me let you know, you have about six minutes left. Oh, I'm running out of time. 
So a lot of people say, Mike, uh, it would have gone away on its own. How do you know? Um, and so we accidentally did the blind experiment because uh, I'd stopped running, and w as we scaled up to 100 people, you'll see in a minute, basically uh, <laughs> uh, we switched project managers and we're collecting all these samples. You saw what it's like to biobank. Imagine all these samples coming in with the data. Nobody's looking at the results. So inadvertently, we were doing a blind experiment. <laughs> and in blue is my glucose, and in red is my hemoglobin. And when see my sugar came back high again. And right when it's at that peak, oh, I can kind of see where underneath there, that's just before Memorial Day of last year. Somebody said, Mike, you realize your hemoglobin A1C is 7.0? I said, no, I had no idea. Apparently, it's been high for almost a year. Uh, and I started running again. That's when I brought it down. But I can't get it below 5.7. So the bottom line, Al, this is I definitely have a metabolic disorder running in me. <laughs> um, I always expected it to come back because age is the number one risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Uh, I just thought it would be 10 years from now, not, you know, 18 months later or something. So that was a big, big surprise for me. What did the skin rash have? Well, these are other things. Let's okay. save that because I have other. I've read to say the other thing we think is going on here, just to bring this back, is that we think what's going on is my genome has me predisposed for type 2 diabetes. And then you'll notice when that occurred, right when this respiratory syncytial virus mm -hmm. came. So okay. what we think is its genes had me predisposed, and then this virus actually mm -hmm. triggered the disease. And this is not real science, but I can tell you anecdotally after we publish this, I've gotten lots of people with very similar stories. And viruses have been associated with type 1, but not type 2 diabetes before. So this has led to a new hypothesis that maybe viruses can be associated with type 2 diabetes, and maybe not in everybody, just those who are genetically predisposed. I think I've heard that there's, like, there's a lot of sort of theories out there that a number of different diseases are affected by viruses. Like maybe that's the trigger that pushes someone. There's a good chance, and we have no idea, because a lot of these things you don't see till a year later or whatever, and the virus is long gone. <laughs> so nobody, and nobody's ever measured what, what, what you know, what, when you get sick, what do people say? You have the flu. They don't know what you had in any of these cases, right? Turns out I've never had the true influenza from these last five years. They've always been RSV, adenovirus, rhinoviruses, other common colds, not once the flu. <laughs> the true flu, that is to say. So... You can see we don't even measure this stuff, but I think that'll change in the future. So the other thing I'll tell you is that we can follow, because we're following, making billions of measurements, we can follow my biochemical pathways at a level no one's ever seen before. It's like an IMAX movie of what's going on when you get sick. Uh, and we can see very interesting changes. My insulin level, I can tell you, has never been the same uh, on average as before that RSV infection. It's dropped. Yeah, so that's one effect. There's lots of other things to bring in. I won't have time to tell you about this, but we you probably heard about epigenetics. Uh, this is influenced by environmental factors uh, and in very poorly understood ways. So your, your nutrition, we know, does affect your DNA methylation in ways that aren't very clear. Exercise affects your DNA methylation. So there's a very interesting study from a Swedish group where they exercised one leg and not the other. They had these... Um, Folks uh, exercising one leg for, I think it was three months, four times a day for 45 minutes. Didn't do the other leg and then took a muscle biopsy and the exercise leg had a different methylation pattern from the unexercised leg. So you can actually affect your DNA, which in turn affects your genes you're expressing. Your age is also uh, affects your DNA methylation pattern, again, which affects your activity of the genes that are expressed. And I can tell you it really works. Somebody's come up with a signature that tells you how old you are based on your methylation pattern. And of course, I assumed I had the methylation pattern of a 25-year-old, but uh, -uh when, they, when we did my genome, it's smack on within a year. Um. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so now I've got to figure out how to get it lower. <laughs> they haven't done it in the same people. They do it on people on average. And so our study is a little unique because we'll be able to do it in young versus old. But that, yeah, they haven't done exactly, which would be a great study. So we're, we're doing this. We're doing this on 40 of my time points. We've actually already done it. We're just analyzing the data. And I won't tell you, but my methylation can make some predictions about some diseases I might be associated with. So I think in the future, you're not only going to get your, your, your genome done, you're going to get your epigenome done as well. And you'll probably get it done in different tissues. Again, this is one of the things that you're going to have. The other thing you can get done is your microbiome. So you probably know there are 10 times as many cells in and on you that aren't you than are you, and it's essential. It 
that lets you digest your food, makes essential vitamins. And these days, the microbiome is associated with every single disease, although what's cause and effect is very murky. So as journalists, you have to watch out for what's real and what's not real. But there are good studies between the inflammatory bowel disease and obesity and di uh, diabetes, and even now myocardial infarction, where there's been some interesting microbiome and pretty solid microbiome associations. So uh, maybe I'll jump over this, but we've done my microbiome at very interesting times. Maybe I'll just give you a, a quick upshot. This one here, in this viral infection that has a star by it, it turns out that um, Sertal is a rhinovirus infection. Nine days later, I got another fever, and we took all kinds of swabs and couldn't figure out what it was. So when we added on the microbiome, the first thing we do is my nasal and my gut and other microbiomes. And what we discovered by doing my nasal microbiome is on the left column is when I'm healthy, where it says fever is when I had the mystery infection, recovery is two days later, and then there's two days after that, and then back to healthy. And it turns out the one bacteria that correlates with when I was sick is that streptococcus pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So the odds are I had a streptococcus infection, which we can figure out after the fact. So this is probably the world's most expensive way to figure <laughs> out <laughs> strep infection. But it's a great proof of principle, right? It shows you can, but this will be done in real time, you see, in the future. And what is important about this particular study is that we also looked at my stool at the same time. So this is my stool microbiome. Left is healthy, you can see fever, recovery. And even though this is a nasal infection and it's where the illness is probably largely being caused, it turns out your stool sample is changing pretty dramatically as well. I'm not saying that's necessarily direct. I actually think this, is, this reflects what's going on in you. When you get sick, it's a systems-wide change that occurs, and I think this is how we want to understand health in the future, by understanding all parts of you as much as possible, and that's why I think these detailed measurements will be very powerful, and I think that's why you'll see these signatures. So I think this is going to be, this is why these guys are doing microbiome sampling here, because they, they want to correlate with, uh, it's going to be a no-brainer. I think this will become a standard of care, right? You give a urine sample, why wouldn't you give a poop sample? Same time, I guarantee you'll see an inflammatory bowel disease long before they diagnose it now. Uh, because th that signature is so strong. Same with colitis, it just jumps out at you for people working in this field. And it's a no-brainer, you know, people write when they have these intestinal problems, they go in, they see all these doctors, it goes on for months and months and months. You can figure that out one shot by looking at somebody's microbiome. So that'll, that'll become standard in the future too, it's just not there yet. So anyway, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm very heavily wired with all these devices. I measure literally all my steps, my biking, my running, my sleep. Uh, I have an Apple Watch and a basis watch, <laughs> heart rate. Uh, also measure, um, you can do all this on your iPhone, by the way. It all feeds into your iPhone. You can measure your electrocardiogram right off your iPhone or off of other devices that feed into your iPhone. So I'm a believer in the future we will be wired for all these things. I have a continuous glucose monitor in me as well because I have glucose problems. So I can sort of follow exactly what's triggering my glucose to go off. I can tell when I eat a banana, I see my glucose just shoot through the roof uh, in very interesting ways. So I can figure out what foods are causing those kinds of issues and which ones don't, and then correlate it with my physiology in a, in a, in a very precise biochemical way. I actually think that is the future. I'm not saying we'll all be wired maybe as much as me, but uh, just to flip through this, we've done a lot of healthy people. I'll just mention the second one. We sequenced 12 healthy people. <coughs> Uh, on average, because a lot of people say, Mike, you're going to make a lot of hypochondriacs if you go around and sequence healthy people. And you heard, uh, I think Gary brought that up today, or was it Parker, uh, Dr. Parker? I think uh, um, either way, the point is that, so we said, well, let's do the experiment. We sequenced 12 healthy people, looked at how many follow-up tests it led. It leads to three follow-up tests on average, and the cost is about $400 to $1,400. So not free, but not ridiculous. But I, importantly, one woman had a BRCA mutation. There was no question it was an inactivating mutation. No family history of breast or ovarian cancer would not have discovered this may have come in through her father's side. Not clear. Uh, could be de novo mutation. Don't know. Uh, but no way she would have known that had we not sequenced her genome. Okay? And I would argue that pays for the entire study in and of itself. Now, she opted for surgery, a la Angelina Jolie, but, you know, I'm not saying she had to do that. There are other options as well, but I would argue it's very useful to have that information. Again, never would have known it had we not sequenced her genome. This is the kind of information you can find. Wait, but how much was the analysis? 
Uh, it's about $15,000 because we're looking up all those variants one by we We can do a lot of automatic processing, but we also have to look them up one by one. Sounds like it's time to go. The other thing I can tell you is that we're going to do, we're doing this for 100 people now. We're studying them just like me. Incredible detail. Yep. Gail. So, um, so some doctors will say, I don't want to do the sequencing because we may find, we're, we won't know what to do with it once we find it. And if people have that kind of reaction by their doc doctors, what should they do? Uh, find another doctor. Um, right now, the problem is who pays, right? It's, that's the problem. So I would argue insurance companies should be paying us to get our genome sequence. But our health care system's not incentivized that way because uh, we change providers with our employer or when they change their plans. And this is where the socialized medicine countries have it all over us. This is why they're actually rolling out these 100,000, there's a 100K UK project to sequence genomes. I think this is one of the reasons why we're now launching this million project thing. I think it's in part to catch up because other groups are launching big projects. Um, so our system's broken. Um, it really doesn't incentivize people. Why should a company pay $17,000 to get your genome sequence when two years from now you're going to be with somebody else? Uh, some companies are getting it because they see it as value added for their program. So Geisinger, you may have heard, is sequencing 250,000 people. That's because they partnered with Regeneron, who wants to sequence all those exomes so they can find the next PSK9, the next right. very cool target yeah. that will help them be druggable and have another drug on the market. So that's an interesting... Uh, there, see, only if you have a problem. There's no... There, you can't get insurance after the fact. After the fact. Only when you're sick. And that's the problem with our system. When you're sick, it's already late. If you've got symptoms, you're in trouble for any disease. Same for the, my diabetes. If I waited until I had symptoms, I'm not in good shape. And so the whole system's falsely incentivized. We have to move it to the point where you are preventative because I think that's when you can do things about your health. <laughs> that's when it will be most effective. You know, so predict and prevent, or at least catch disease early, you can do it with all these markers and all these sensors, you have a much better way of managing your health than waiting till you get sick. Then you're down the slippery slope where it's really expensive, really hard, and it's just not the way to do medicine. So I think the socialized program will have it all over us, although it is true that genome sequencing will become cheaper and the interpretation should become a lot cheaper that will make this possible more reliable. in the future and more reliable as well. Well, we'll still be clunky no matter what you do. That's another thing a lot of people say, well, it's really clunky, we don't know how to do it. It's true, but so is imaging. Imaging is just terrible for those of you who, I mean, <laughs> you interpreting images. By the way, you give the same, you saw the pathology slides today. You can give the same pathology sections to several pathologists. You don't always get the same answer. In fact, it only agrees about 60% of the time. So these fields are all clunky, and but they're still better than doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I think I threw a lot out there. <laughs> it's That's probably right. also time to go. That's all right. Very fascinating yeah. topic. Thank you so sorry much. Sorry to go. Anyway, that is one.